different campaigns as well. Um, but yeah, again, that hasn't been super successful. So yeah, interested to hear more. Um, I might have to drop off early, so I apologise in advance if that happens. But yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing more. No problem. Um, this is being recorded. I should have actually double checked that right at the beginning. Um, if anyone has an issue with that or needs to be cut out at some point, let me know. Are people okay with that for now? There's just a few people that couldn't make it. So um, we're going to get into the habit. I think this is sort of the early stages of what we're calling the Rebel School of the Air. Um, which is uh, going to be a series of training for grassroots activists open to you know seasoned um, campaigners from non-government organizations but my focus is in wanting to skill up grassroots activists uh, and hence actually this particular one as being one of our early sessions because I find that it is um, I just got a hello from an old family member privately. That's very nice. Um, uh, I find that um, uh, I, I think it's a particularly underused resource for grassroots activists. And I think that it's one way that we can kind of help really bring ourselves out of the bubble um, without having, you know, those professional comms teams and a lot of the resources um, from the people I see here, I think it's mainly grassroots folks, really. Um, so that to me is the power of Twitter. And um, as Kari was saying, you know, one of the things with um, cutting back of newsrooms at the moment and just, you know, like the complete downsizing of uh, so many media agencies is, is that they rely quite heavily on Twitter now. So you can actually, you know, if you're lucky, you can send out a media release get in a, a few embedded tweets and that's your article about excuse me your action that day um so that does work to our advantage to an extent so just something to um to think about and i've got a couple of examples of that um uh stephen has just joined us hey stephen um Hello. just getting people's names and uh, what country they're on and if they're involved in an organization um, i mean um what you can Nunga country and uh, I'm uh, on the Committee of Friends of Australian Rock Art. We've been campaigning since 2006 to protect the um, globally significant uh, Aboriginal cultural heritage of the Burrett Peninsula. Also very engaged in um, Aboriginal heritage uh, protection activism in WA Great. more generally. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so I do want to introduce Kai. Um, I, I might go through a couple of basics first and then uh, we'll give, um, uh, we'll sort of hand over to Kai for the, uh, we're going to look at his particular situation as a case study. So just in terms of the agenda and what we're going to cover off today, we are going to um, go through to 6.30, 8.30, basically. Um, we're on two different time slots here. It's actually really nice to have people from across the country, and that's actually one of the main things that I've been hoping to, to build more of. Um, this one, this event in particular, was a little bit of a uh, casualty of uh, spending a lot of time working on solidarity work last week with the Black Lives Matter um, massive event that happened in Borloo, Perth, here. Uh, so we've got some people that I think may still join, um, but it's actually quite a nice small group, which I'm happy about. So it will make it easier for people to do a bit more interactive um, pieces of work and just checking that it is loud noises at the front of my house. <clears throat> um, so... One of the things that I would love to encourage is for people to be active and interactive in this session. Um, so hands up, who has got yourself a Twitter account? Does everyone actually have one? Okay, is that most people? Who hasn't? Okay. Um, I'm gonna suggest that you set one up now. Um, if you... Uh, happy to multitask that. Um, was there just two or three people? Who put their hand up to not having one? No, okay. 
I think it might have been a delay on my film. So you've all got one. So um, in terms of sharing learnings, uh, I'm going to give people the opportunity to live tweet this webinar. So if there's any juicy case studies or references or you want to laugh at my hair or anything like that, um, you can use the hashtag rebel school and what we will do later is we'll have a go at writing a couple of tweets and uh, give you an example of sort of an action or an event um, and get you to actually um, do some trial tweets. Um, so if there are good resources, um, that is a way that we can uh, collate them all up. And I would actually encourage everybody to put your Twitter handle in the Zoom chat. And what we will do is I'll create a list of those um, because one of the fundamental principles I think we need to have at the grassroots is digital solidarity. So, you know, we can keep an eye out for each other and retweet and amplify each other's um, work. And if we all develop that as a bit of a habit, I think that's just going to really help us get our messages out further. So... I did send out some information just on the absolute basics of Twitter. I think um, it sounds like most people have an account and, sorry, there's one more person waiting, <clears throat> excuse me, have an account and at least are familiar with the basic terms. So I'm not going to go into that. Is that fair enough? So if I, people um, do understand, you know, a Twitter username, a hashtag, a handle, just those kind of basic terms, are they all broadly understood? No, no, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Can you just quickly? Run yep. So, this? Stephen, there is yep. in that link in the link that I sent. Oh, sorry. Yes. Look, I yeah. Haven't, I'm sorry, I haven't had time to to to. to no, look that's that. okay. Just just go have a look at that um, yep. while we're doing some of the intro uh, okay. stuff with Kai, because sure. it sounds like you might be one of the only ones. So, rather than yeah, we'll keep sort of moving along. If you just okay. want to have a little look at that sure. in the meantime. Yeah. Um, we can do at some point I'm happy to do a 101 class as well um, so uh, that can happen too but I thought that, that, that there's actually more people who are using it or have started to using it but it's um, you know maybe not you know I think a lot of people get into it get quite disheartened um, and or see that really negative side of it and I just want to encourage you to I think it's one of the forums that we can have some control over. So I want to encourage that. So any, um, uh, so you want to have your, your either Twitter screen open um, on, on the side uh, or TweetDeck and I'll explain TweetDeck. Uh, that's a little bit, it looks a little bit overwhelming when you first open it, but it's actually a very easy way to organize information and I'll go through that um, with you, particularly if you're using uh, Twitter for political analysis or tracking campaign work. Um, so I should also acknowledge that I'm on Bulu, um, uh, uh, Wallyalup, sorry, uh, Fremantle and um, Wajak Noongar country. And one of the exciting things that I saw on the weekend was actually uh, the Black Lives Matter Perth event did actually get trending on Twitter, which is um, actually not that hard to do if you've got a few people putting in some, you know, like some significant effort. So that's just to give you a sense that it's not this huge mountain where you need to have thousands of people with thousands of followers in order to get an issue trending. Um, and that puts it on the radar of mainstream media and politicians and a whole heap of other people. So just to acknowledge that and also to say that in terms of the Black Lives Matter um, internationally, that's where I get my news, you know, that's where I am I look to find out what's happening in a bunch of different cities around um, the country, sorry, around the world. Um, and for me, any, any breaking news, basically, Twitter is incredibly useful for that because you're actually getting unfiltered uh, live information from on ground. But we want to start off with a positive, fluffy, cute, adorable case study. And that's Kai as a human being. He's adorable and fluffy and uh. cute. 
Um, he's also mates with koalas, but whatever. Um, so Kai and I have known each other for a while back uh, and um, there was a point when, which was the month that you went up for the first time to Kangaroo Island? Uh, it was the end of Jan, right at the end of Jan. Yeah. Um, so Kai went up to Kangaroo Island um, and dealt with uh, a lot of the koalas that were uh in pretty significant trouble, really full on burns, pretty traumatic experience. Just want to acknowledge that that was not a um, a fun thing and that it's a hard thing to talk about and thank Kai for taking time out, even though um, it's a, you know, it's a, there's still a lot of stress and um, uh, stuff to process. So thank you for uh, joining us anyway and um, being generous enough to share the, the learnings. Um, we thought we might show a little short video, uh, which was just one of the pieces of international media that I think it's fair to say that your, your Twitter, your live tweeting and your storytelling on Twitter is what instigated a lot of this mass media. Is that fair to say? Largely, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, so now what I need to double check is if we're going to, um, if the sound is going to behave and if it's going to actually play for me through my browser. So just bear with me one moment. We'll see if it behaves. And if not, we'll come back. Um, studio. Where are we? Okay. I thought I had the BBC one in there. There it is. Okay, so can people just give me a wave if you can hear the sound on this? Okay. Um, Nick, I can share some of my, my, my social media skills now. If you go into advanced settings under share screen, there's one for share your audio slash share uh, media content. Um, I think that that is on already. It sounds like oh, okay. people can hear. Did you catch the sound when I first started it? You could hear really, really, really faint low. background. Oh, okay. Like a All, right. Whisper. All right, I'll double check. Um, but, but, uh, one second. You can remind me where that is actually. Um, so when you go into share screen options, it's advanced. Actually, I'll stop that and I'll start it again. Just you just mean share computer sound, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay, let's try that. Uh, so yeah, just start the top of the blue gum. Yeah? Yeah, heaps better. Great, okay. So this is Kai's story. Uh, so yeah, just start the top of the blue gum. And uh, now I'm just gonna get this little one and we're gonna go back. Okay, that does not seem to want to load, even though I preloaded it. Um, so apologies for that. I'm just going to let it kind of play and catch up a little bit. Um, and well, yeah, Nick, if it's easier, I can just talk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll let it go in the background, and if it if it behaves itself, then um, we can come back to it. But yeah. let us just go back to open screen. Oops. Yeah, so um, 
I guess for me, I'm sure people are just generally interested in the story that Kai has to tell about, you know, going up there and what that experience was like. Um, maybe if you just want to talk, give that little bit of an intro, and then I'll ask you a few more questions about the particular role of Twitter and the live socials that you were doing and how that helped. Yeah, for sure. Um, I guess, yeah, when I started, like I was, I've done a bunch of um, storytelling through social media for campaigning before. And, you know, it's really been an absolute mission to get any attention um, on issues um, that are, you know, really important. And um, yeah, Kangaroo Island was kind of different for me because I was, I was, telling the story but it's I mean part of it was just like really just coping and 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 engaging with people um just as a human and um and I think I had about a hundred Twitter followers at the time and I'd always been shit at Twitter and um and I thought you had to be really really kind of clever and and funny and and uh yeah that I don't know, I guess I'm, yeah, that didn't really work for me, whatever that meant. And, um, uh, and so, yeah, I was kind of talking about what I was doing down there and yeah, like really thank, thank goodness you, um, Nick, like, <laughs> um, you kind of just sent that tweet out, um, to your followers, um, just to say, Hey, support, support me um and yeah that was the thing that kind of just triggered this snowball really and and like a tweet that nobody saw or yeah saw or cared about all of a sudden was getting hundreds of thousands of interactions and um and then yeah from that point i guess i don't know what happens with algorithms or things like that but you know having once there are like maybe five or six people follow you and they're all like friends of the same person and that'll show up in people's timelines. And then, you know, all people, I guess, yeah, that, that comes up as a notification for people that it almost like creates this trend that um, there's a new person being followed. And um, yeah, and that's really key, I think, to, to build that following. Um, so do people know what Kai's talking about when he says that? You know, like when you, so in your feed, the way that they have changed the algorithm in Twitter is that you um, don't necessarily just get uh, news from people that you follow like you used to. Um, you'll actually get news from, you know, like five of your followers, five of the people you follow have liked this or five of them have followed this person. And then that becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, like, the same that you have with Facebook shares, you know, when 20 people share one thing at once, you know, gives you that power of attraction. Mm -hmm. And then I guess, yeah, once you've kind of sent a few tweets that have done well or triggered some kind of algorithm again, um, I think, yeah, you know, just you can, maybe it, it sets you up for your next tweets or it like, um, yeah, anticipates that the same people will like the same, the tweets from the same person, I'm not sure. But so, you know, instead of Twitter being this thing where I had to be clever and use all these hashtags, then it's just, I can write, you know, a sentence without any hashtags that's just like, just an expression even, um, that's just really uh, yeah authentic. Um, and it doesn't need a hashtag because I've got a following, um, and I've got, yeah, like a, a person, like a history and I guess a community and, and um, yeah, it becomes more about that. And then, and that's what it's be become for me now. Um, but I guess on the other side was um, that attention that was created yeah it did certainly lead to all those journos um paying attention mm. and and even yeah like tweeting some of the the videos um 
meant that journos on the other side of the world could just grab all that footage, create a piece and, and then just maybe do like a five minute uh, interview with me and they had their story. Um, so that was another really good, um, yeah, outcome of that. And I think, I guess, like to just put it in a context of the, the political time that it was in is that, you know, you were up there in the, almost in the immediate aftermath of the fires or when some fires were still going, you know, people had been dealing with blackened skies in Sydney and Melbourne, you know, it, it felt very oppressive and um, it was actually, you know, just, you know, like there's not many people that can say no to a koala. And, um, you know, so the actual, the, I, I don't, so for me, I would say that I don't think that you changed any way that you talked. Um, you just actually had more followers and, um, you know, hashtags are useful as a way of indexing campaigns and talking on issues. But once you have a certain number of followers, you know, it doesn't matter what, what hashtag, <clears throat> you know, Donald Trump uses or, Beyonce mm. users or whatever people with really massive followings, but still, um, you know, people who are up at five, ten thousand followers. You know, it's not so important what hashtag they use because they've simply got the audience that's sort of there waiting. Um, so I don't think that it was that that you went from being bad at Twitter to, <laughs> you know, like you were still doing so bad at it. You were still talking like you and that's the thing that I think that people actually related to was this person who just seemed like this average person who was doing this stuff that people found quite fascinating and you know you know some of the footage of I think the one in particular where you like swung across the tree to grab one of them really quickly mm. um, one of the ones that wasn't very happy about coming down <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, some of those I saw just embedded in articles and, and going everywhere. Um, so, and, and one thing I will say as well is that uh, I don't have it. I don't have a personally a massive Twitter following. I've got about 3,000, I think. So, yeah. you know, like that's respectable, but it's not by any means large in terms of some of the political activists that have large followings in Australia. Um, but... I've also got friends with large following. So it was just really spending, I think, maybe a couple of hours just direct messaging some people and haranguing some people and just like retweeting and retweeting Kai's content mm. to just get it to the level that a few more people noticed it and then it became its own, um, mm. you know, the, the content, the quality of the content took over. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Hayes, for that. <laughs> You, you you can give me a shout out in your book deal <laughs> <laughs> and yeah so Kai's got two books out of it and international media so yeah, digital, soli digital solidarity for the win it's great yeah, yeah. Um, I thought you were joking <laughs> oh no it's insane <laughs> yeah um, and uh, but so you wouldn't have gotten and again I think like this is where to you know to actually recognize the skill that you had in telling your stories is that you wouldn't have you wouldn't have gotten a book deal if you weren't this very you came across as yourself and I think that to me that is the one like a really really key lesson in Twitter is to be authentic um, yeah. and for you can just tell you know like there's, pe there's people that are popular um, like there's one guy for example who is this sort of really cheerful bogan who signs every like actually signs his name off ian every time you know and just updates people about his day and it you know he's kind of like not what you expect and he's got a few thousand followers because you know ian's really cheerful and people like listening to what ian's up to you know so there's sort of um it's hard to apart from people when you get into that rock star band of you know fandom i think i think twitter actually really shows if you're fake like if you're a, if you're a sort of a fake person um you know there's another woman that tweets is very very sweary and tweets all in caps and i find her really funny and i really enjoy you know following her and she just um you know she makes me laugh um and she's also really sharp politically so it's 
like you can kind of try and do things that you think are going to get you followers but i think it's actually just being yourself and and mm. thinking about the content that you put out there that that's genuinely what people resonate with yeah i think i don't know yeah i'm still figuring out what's going to happen just in terms of yeah all these all these people following me because of this thing that i did in a way and then kind of I guess finding out if they're going to follow me still for who I am and, and, and also just like, yeah, working out how much, yeah. How much of yourself do you, you know, continue to share of mm. your everyday life as, as an authentic person and, and yeah, what that looks like. I'm still working all that out. Um, and, and like, like, what is, I guess, what does that mean too for, you know, someone who does really want to advocate for, you know, environmental justice and yeah, and, and engage people on those issues as well. And mm. yeah. Do you want to talk about the type of people that so follow you? Yeah, hmm? Do you want to talk about the type of people that follow you? The, the I, diversity of? I mean, I really, I think, you know, I've, I've kind of got angry enough at the government now enough times that probably it's, it's pretty progressive. Um, but I think, and I think a bunch of more conservative people that would have followed me cause they, you know, like koalas, um, will have dropped off by now. Basically. <laughs> All those, yeah. um, huggable Trump loving koala lovers. <laughs> yeah. 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 Cause I had, I had those, I, I engaged, you know, these people that I thought were, I would never engage in my life. Um, through Twitter and koalas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Erin, Erin, uh, so we've got a couple of questions here. So Glenn's asking how long you spent on there and Erin's asking how much of ourselves should we be giving? And that's actually, I think that's a really um, uh, big one uh, for me. I find that in a weird way, because I work by myself a lot of the time, that I am actually kind of like weirdly honest and open on Twitter, and quite a lot of people are as well. It's a, it's a really interesting uh, phenomenon, I think, where you there is actually once you are on there for a while, that it does feel like that these people are your community to an extent, and it's really interesting. And I know that Kai, you talked really honestly about the struggles that you had and being really emotional and being really raw. Um, yeah. Do you want to comment on that at all? Mm, yeah. Like I guess I'm cause life continues to be a bit of a struggle right now. And my emotions are a bit raw now um, for different reasons. And so I, 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 like part of me really wants to just express that too. And, and um, yeah, I guess I see, you know, with things like, book deals coming out of this and and being able to engage people like for me I really want to be able to model what it like what it can be to be a, a bloke and be emotional and and express yourself too and so yeah that's a whole nother story but I do I, yeah I kind of would like to yeah, I'm not sure how much to, or how personal, or how, yeah, how how far to go in terms of letting pull in. Mm. Um, yeah, right now, because it's not, yeah, it's the rest of my life. It's not just this one event that will end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Has anyone got any thoughts on that themselves in terms of that particular tension of how much to share and what you've shared? Stephen, you're on mute. Hold on. Um, yeah, I just think um, if you're campaigning, I mean, to what extent do you have to have some kind of constructive personality that you're projecting out into the cybersphere? Can't you just talk about your campaign? You can. Um, and the thing is, though, that what I guess the reason that I thought it was useful for people to hear from Kai um, 
I did actually ask, there's a couple of campaigns that have done very, very well, which I'll talk about briefly, the uh, Not My Debt and the Robo Debt campaign is a really, really excellent example of um, like a group, group sourced um, Twitter uh, campaign that had really massive political outcomes. But I think the, the, the reason that people related to Kai apart from the cute koalas is that he was really honest and it felt like people like if you go back and have a look and we I, i'm going to go onto another screen once we've sort of finished this piece of the chat and we'll go and have a look at, at, the, at the tweets and the different styles that people use is that um people it's this it's the same with any any type of theory around social change and what people listen to people listen to stories not facts. People listen to people, not, you know, statistics about trees. Um, so bringing that into mind, like actually being a genuine person and coming across as someone who cares or as someone who's just like sassy as or someone who is um, very kind, um, you know, that to me makes a difference. And, and that to me is also part of how you can sort of want of a better word like curate your experience on twitter so it's not just all about being in the cesspit you know like i follow some people that are really lovely that i just sort of have little chats with and um uh you know progressive but maybe we're not exactly on the same page on everything um which is good you don't want to have a complete bubble um and like I remember asking, for example, at one point, you know, for people to give me advice on, you know, some conservative folk to follow that, um, you know, were reasonable, you know, like not like Andrew Bolt, you know. So there's one guy that I follow um, who I have these kind of feisty debates with, but they're pretty civil and, you know, has got some interesting views and, and that challenges me and that's good. So um, I don't think it has to be a constructed personality, but I do think it's worth thinking about how much of yourself you want to put out there. Um, yeah, and for that to be, um, yeah, to go into your thinking. Erin, um, you asked the question. Did you have a thought that you wanted to share on it? Uh, I mean, I have thoughts rather than thoughts, really. Um, so I'm new to Twitter. Uh, I've used Facebook quite a lot in the past for social media and for Facebook it's very much a case of whenever there's a new campaign um, and I'm, I'm a bit of a campaign junkie so I jump from, from issue to issue all the time, you have a dedicated space and a dedicated voice that tweets about, not sorry, not tweets, but creates social media about that. Um, and Twitter to me is very new uh, and... I've found it quite difficult. Uh, on Facebook, I have always utilised a pseudonym for my personal, you know, my personal account, my friends, so to speak. And so I feel like I can be very, very honest in that space without repercussions. Yeah. Um, Twitter, I initially joined uh, for work-related reasons. And so it has my face, it has my name, it's very identifiable. Um, and I'm, I'm finding it actually just a very difficult space to navigate um, because part of me wants to be as vulnerable as I would be in my other social media engagements, um, which, you know, if I was having a terrible day and, you know, thinking about throwing in the towel, I would probably say that on Facebook quite honestly. Um, but I, and I really hear what you're saying, Kai, about vulnerability, um, but I am also quite wary that that vulnerability um, should be rewarded and often is rewarded in men um, but often isn't rewarded for women yeah and these things worry me they worry me a great deal <laughs> yeah. and and i think there's a very it depends on your work as well very clearly um there's a very strong line between you know um uh, like i went for some contract work with a a uh more conservative progressive group like still a progressive group but a very um um i guess i i would say like if count like counteract had a personality it's sort of fairly feisty and defiant and it's about civil resistance and so it's okay that um 
that we have a voice and a tone that is cheeky and like that's you know I've actually we've, we've got a social media document that finally got around to writing about like what is the voice what is the tone what do we comment on what do we not comment on what do we have a stance on and that kind of stuff um, myself as a person um, I think I probably am too blunt sometimes I uh, you know, I'm too honest. Um, I definitely would leave myself vulnerable um, in terms of, you know, people say that it's your own personal social media account, but that's your voice out in the world. So the consideration does need to be, you know, is that actually going to help legitimise the cause or whatever you are trying to talk about or not? Um, so that is definitely a consideration for people that maybe don't have as... Um, as flexible a situation as I do, for example. Yeah. Um, I'm just wanting to double check here. Uh, is there some confusion about what, Sana, are you asking what your username is on Twitter? Is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah, Michael was asking me my username. And uh, I... Yeah, that's me. I was trying to follow everyone and Sana, I couldn't actually work out which one was her. Um, I just set, with... up, set it okay, up uh... because I couldn't find my old one. <laughs> Okay, so you, oh, you've sorted, sorted it then. Okay. Um, so I'll just go back to Kai for a couple of other um, uh, questions. Um, uh, well, one of them was how often, how much time did you spend? Because um, I know you were doing a bit of, you're doing Facebook updates and you're doing Twitter. And then Kai also was doing a crowdfunder. And so there's that sense of wanting to be accountable to the people that are donating to you as well and telling the stories was I guess kind of part of that deal really wasn't it like people mm. people felt like they'd invested in you and so yeah. that was their um not their reward but you know like that was actually something that was appreciated to that came back out of it yeah for sure um so the question like how much time did I spend social mediaing yeah oh heaps <laughs> I mean <laughs> I, I guess I I really just copied and pasted largely like um between well at least between Instagram and, and Twitter. Um and then and then would just do like a really quite lengthy Facebook update each night initially for the initial week or two when I was by myself and that was like largely just kind of downloading and, and coping and then once the crowdfunder started up, yeah, it did. And once I had, um, like, Freya came over and helped me and I had that emotional kind of support, then it was more about updating people and less about coping. Yeah, yeah. Freya being the second climber you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Um, so maybe I might actually go to... I'm not actually going to talk about the difference between campaigning with Facebook and Twitter because it's quite um it's a different it's quite a different thing I think um, so I'm going to leave that question um, because there's actually quite a I've got a, a quite a bit of other content to go through with you folks as well and we're probably not going to cover everything even as it is just talking about Twitter so I'm going to go back to share screen and actually just show you. Um, who is who is familiar with TweetDeck? Okay, uh, Kai and Glenn. And if any of the people who are on phones um, want to... <laughs> I like how we, we're talking about the important things. How did you do the amazing bat photo? <laughs> that, was a, that was an example of... Um, of a photo that should have gone further in my mind, actually, um, that had all of that potential. Do you want to speak to the, what we're talking about, Kat? Sure. Um, yeah, that was at the Laird State Forest back in 2013 or something, maybe, 14, um, hanging off a coal loader. They were trying to put a coal mine in the middle of a forest, so we decided to dress up as some of the endangered species that were living there and stop work for the day. And we only had a flip phone on us, so we each took photos of the other person. And I think we uploaded them online. Uh, definitely wasn't on Twitter, so could have yeah. gone further with that one. <laughs> yeah. 
I think also we're in a really different space with Twitter and Insta now than, you know, even five or six years ago. Um, but I would actually say, and, you know, Glenn might want to speak to this as well, that the um, the Laird Forest campaign and the campaign around Moores Creek and trying to stop that Whitehaven mine was probably one of the earlier examples of pretty decent grassroots social media, um, actually, that was, you know, semi-organised and, you know, did have a little bit of a, um, a, a sort of a personality and a voice and a bit of consistency to it. Um, and yeah, I think that that was, um, that's a good example if people ever want to go back and look at that hashtag. Um, so, uh, yes, I don't think you can add an image to a chat, but when I flip over to the um, screen of the browser, I will see if um, I can bring it up as well. So I'm just going to go to TweetDeck and explain a few things for you all. <clears throat> Oops, this one. And we'll share, I'll share that. Um, we'll share that video for you guys to have a look at as well. I'll just pop that over in the in the chat screen in a sec. So tweet. So your your basic. Um, oops, come here. Your basic interface for Twitter uh, is, is, you know, relatively simple and uh, easy to use on, um, uh, you know, your phone or online on a computer. Um, but I'm just going to show you some of the advantages of TweetDeck, just so you can sort of get a sense for uh, how you can use it to track issues. So essentially you, it gives you, it's, so TweetDeck basically gives you an option to have multiple accounts. So if you've got a personal account plus a work-based account, um, you can tweet from either of those. Uh, it means that if you, you know, have, have got various different personalities you can be retweeting yourself and you know that can be sort of helpful to to boost your message out but if you have a look up here you've um i'm not going to i'm not going to show you the the whole um there we go we've got erin wins the award for is it the first tweet rebel school of the air um so I so that's a column that is that's my home column here, which is my personal one. This is anything that I come up in a mention as. Um, this is so TweetDeck you can use to to schedule tweets. So if you have a um, an action that's happening or you want to do a promo for an event and have it lined up, uh, then you can. Um, use that to do that. Um, just trying to work out how to keep this so I can move around. So scheduled. Okay. And then there are hashtags that I keep a watch on. So to give you a sense here, Oz Law Watch is one that I have been recently following, which is um, a lot of lawyers and um, you know progressive sort of academics that are following law, looking at issues around the, some of the stuff with the COVID laws, things like that. Um, this is a list. So one of the top tips in terms of how you can curate your Twitter experience is that you choose who you want to follow. And there might be people that you want to monitor but you don't actually want to follow. Like they're people that are your opponents, they are people that are nasty, but you know that they're talking about you. So, um, or your, sorry, your campaign issue or whatever. So in that case, you can actually add them to a list. And what that means is that if I had, I'll show you one of mine. So if I go to, Whoop. 
Oops, not that one. It's just a little bit tricky with the um, um, the two different screens. I just need to get better at juggling them all. Apologies. So if I go to lists, I have got. Well, here we go. I started. I started thinking I should start tracking the Stopadani trolls. So people that were obviously paid by industry uh, to do stuff. Um, there's different groups of people that I've followed. Um, there, one of the things that I do want to do is to get a bit more of an organised media list. So there are a lot of people that have already you know, gathered up media. So you can also subscribe to other people's lists. But the advantage of lists is that you don't have to be following the people. So you can just look at them in your own time. So special snowflakes, my special snowflakes list is um, a list of assholes, basically. <laughs> so, you know, it's the Australian Petroleum Production, it's Matt Canavan, it's Malcolm Roberts, it's people that um, I know who I don't want to be actively inviting into my life and for me to be enraged every time I see one of them say something really stupid, but they are uh, in a little list that I occasionally check in on if there's something that's happening. So that, that is just, that to me is like one of my number one tips for managing um, your, your Twitter experience, I guess, um, is um, for practical reasons like gathering up people that are all talking about, say, refugee issues or um, whatever issues that you're working on, or um, using that to collect um, practical lists. So if you are at an action and you want to be tweeting at media saying, hey, the West Australian, you know, we're down here occupying this office, doing this thing, come on down, um, that's what it's worth it for. Um, and so I'm just going to give you this example so we can have a look at Kai's work. Like, how do you say no to content like that? Really? It's pretty bloody good. You can't. Um, you just can't. It's not possible. Um, so hang on. I need to get rid of you. I need to get... Uh, my mouse is not cooperating with the. Hmm. Come on now. Okay. Yeah. So, did you want to speak to any of the? If I sort of scroll through, uh, Kai? Yeah. Oh, I don't know what to say. Just, you know, there's. I mean, I mean, yeah, certain things from that whole kind of event have become, I mean, not certain things, but like, you know, Joey Kai's got like her own fan club almost and like her own hashtag now. So, well, it's like things become memes and yeah, yeah. And so the good, I mean, the good thing that you, that you managed to do is to, and I'll ask you a little bit about the tech and the gear that you use, because I presume you had a, a, a helmet cam and some stuff like that, is that you were able to capture content that was like, it was a little bit rough, but it was good enough to embed in news articles. And so I think that that's a, a useful lesson for people is that people will say, media will never use anything that they haven't filmed themselves. And if it's good enough, they actually will. Um, so to just, you know, have that in mind, um, there was, uh, you know, the level of footage that we're getting on our phones now is, um, is actually really useful. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess it also just that, you know, you've got media, like big deal media that'll just make pure, pure online content and, and that can go, so far i think like the hack the, the hack article they just took all my it just embedded my my own images and um from instagram and twitter um in their article and oh, that was insane i don't know tens of thousands of shares of that article and 
because they'd embedded all those images and videos linked back to my accounts and which like led people to follow those accounts. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I actually, I tried to take some GoPro footage and things like that. And it just ended up being too much of a, a fuck around really. And so I really just stuck to the phone um, and just tried to keep things really simple. Um, oh, okay. And, so you, and, you were actually just hanging there with a the phone or did you have yeah. some kind of clips or anything? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Like I had little lanyard so I don't drop the phone, but yeah. Yeah, that was just the most achievable kind of realistic thing to do in the end at the time. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other any other sort of tips on grabbing the content or did you were you in range? So did you capture it live and upload it straight away or how did you manage that aspect of it? Uh yeah, sometimes I was always uh, I'm not always in range. I guess when I was in range, I'd do that if I had the time. Otherwise, yeah, just wait and kind of try and make it as current as possible as well. Uh, yeah. And, oh, one little thing I discovered was how you can like write like however many, I don't even know how many characters your limit is, but whatever, 100 and whatever. And then now you can- Now 280. Whoa. Yeah, it got it got doubled really? from one forty. Okay, and then you press your little. Okay. Um, Sorry, say again. Thought... Oh, just something that I learned was that you can fill that up. You could like write a whole essay if you want, like a whole thread. Yeah. And then post that whole thread at one time. You don't have to like write, then post, then add another tweet. Does that, is that making sense? Yes, yes. So what, um, what, what Kai is saying is that basically um, in um, Twitter, and I think they let you do it in, um, in uh, TweetDeck as well, is that say I'm typing in here, then it will generally give me an option to like add a tweet. So it will actually give you an auto thread situation. Mm. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you can actually, you're not limited in that, in the way you think you are, I guess. And, yeah. you know, I, so I, I'd spent all this time just writing these updates on Facebook because I thought I had to use that for longer updates um, and then linking them in Twitter and therefore getting like less, um, less uptake on those updates. Um, mm hmm when I could have, I guess, been writing these, yeah, kind of big threads and um, engaging people on Twitter a bit more. Yeah. 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 So that was something I wish I'd known straight away. Yeah. Um, and so, like, that's probably one thing that we won't go into, but there's a whole heap of different, like, there's different etiquette about how to do threads and some people will number each tweet and, um, you know, try to make sure it's all done in the, in the right order. But if you are telling a story of something, then that actually can be, yeah, a really useful way. Um, and there's also a little tool called um, Thread Unroller. And um, so people that have written a thread of, you know, 20 tweets, you can just write, please unroll to the Thread Unroller app and you'll get it all in a nice, neat sort of order to be able to read. Um, so that's pretty handy. Um, just while I'm here, I'm just going to note a few other things and I've, I can see that the, the chat button is flashing. So I'll come back and have a look at that in a second. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The, um, this is just another little example that I found really uh, heartwarming, I guess. A, a few years ago, there was a very racist cartoon that was done by Bill Leake and um, it was basically, I don't even, yeah, I don't even know if they showed it because it really doesn't deserve to be shown, but basically it was a horrible characterization of, of um, Aboriginal fathers. And um, this is something that I kind of helped, yeah, I mean, basically kind of helped get off the ground in that um, there was a couple of people I knew with not very big followings that tweeted about 
their Indigenous dads to try to tell an alternative story, a positive story of Indigenous dads. And I just did what I think allies should do, which is just a lot of uh, signal boosting and amplification work and just sharing it to some people and, you know, sending it to someone, you know, a friend that's got 20,000 followers and saying, you know, hey, have you seen this? It's really beautiful. And so they basically... It, I think it trended for two days and um, you guys are seeing these for this right the scroll but a guardian article people seeing that is anyone still there <laughs> can you see that Kai yeah I can see it okay great so yeah, we're, we're getting good things we're doing things up Oh, good. Yeah, no, I just didn't have um, the thing open. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, that's pretty gorgeous. Not only do I know my son's name, but I named a superhero after him. Um, uh, the guy who wrote the Clever Man series. And this um, ended up, you know, going for days. And I actually curated, there was an app called Storify, uh, which unfortunately is no more. Um, because I actually collected them all on Storify. And so it was just this really, really beautiful list of all of these people talking about how proud they were of their dads and just, yeah, just a real, a real lovely reclaiming of that, of that sort of that public square space that is Twitter and um, turning just something gross into something really lovely. So just some little things like that, you know, when you build up a bit of a following, then you can actually help with, um, yeah, with signal boosting this kind of stuff. And that to me is one of the, is one of the worthwhile pieces. Um, and I'll give you just a couple of other examples while we're here and I'll flip back to the other screen. So um, this is a resource live tweeting at rallies and marches that is on the Counteract website. So you can go and have a look at that. Uh, it's got some practical tips as well as some tips about how to do photos and stuff like that. But I'm also going to cover that in the little presentation that I've got in a second. Um, this is an example of the, the way that just tweets can make up a story, particularly in, in uh, publications like the Daily Mail. So this was an action a few years ago. Uh, Commonwealth Bank shuts down 11 branches and it would have been informed, presumably, by, you know, a pretty basic media release. And if you have a look at it, it is just... Um, a series of tweets and they've just basically ripping content off Twitter, short little videos, different photos, a couple of little updates, um, you know, that they could get on the phone. Oh, RIP Bill Ryan, that's one that I took um, to try to make it look like Bill was doing a selfie, <laughs> which was a bit of a stretch, but um yeah. It worked. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a, one of my favourite photos. And, you know, and you can see some of these photos aren't great as well. Like, you know, that's an, a, it's an average photo. It's not a bad photo. But um, one of the things that I think is useful is to realise that your early photos that you put out on social media could end up being the image that defines your campaign. So to just put in a little bit of effort into having some decent photos will make the difference between, you know, how far that might travel or not. And I remember seeing one that was people who had put heaps of effort into beautiful costumes and very, very, you know, well-designed banners. And then they took a photo that was just at a weird angle with a bunch of junk all around them. And, in, you know, it could have been an iconic image and instead that opportunity was lost. So one of the things is that even when you've got the resources to have professional photographers, that it's actually worth uh, just putting in the effort to just try to get like those sort of slightly better quality photos um, on your phone and, and to just learn a little bit about how to use your phone a bit better. So <clears throat> I can show an example 
of that one again. So I think someone said that they were, it was the Uniting Church, correct? That you get, someone was saying, I'm pretty sure I saw a couple of tweets from you guys. You're just gonna have to speak up because I don't have the other screen open. No, maybe they had to pop back out. So I'll just go down and show you a couple of different examples of different. So this is a good one. Like basically everyone loves signs. People seem to be really getting heaps back into the cute homemade signs again in the last few years. So that's always something that's, um, you know, fun and easy and kind of colourful stuff to tweet. Uh, then you've got, um, you know, you've got like big crowd pictures to give the scale of like, you know, that's that's a good photo as an example. She's a journo, so she's obviously got some insight into, you know, just getting photos that show scale and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> And there's a few others. So this was um, a really great drone shot which showed the scale and also showed the social distancing. So it really helped um, push back against the narrative that protesters were being unsafe. Um, so if you have got an opportunity for, you know, those kind of shots to then upload onto socials they're probably going to be shared very very broadly um, and I'll see if I can find the difference between there was I might have to go to my own username <clears throat> but there was someone who was who sent me some photos oops I don't want that No, I actually would have put them in counteract. Excuse me. So I was running around helping with a bunch of stuff. Um, I try to do a bit of multitasking tweeting while I can on the counteract account. But um, so there's a few that I took. They're not particularly you know, they're not particularly amazing photos, but they do give you that sort of sense of what's happening at the event. Um, it was a cute little, cute little doggo with um, the correct outfit on. And then I'll try to give you an example of one with someone who's actually got a better eye than me, photography. And it's, it's basically if you're doing this for an event or a rally of some kind, then uh, you just want to be retweeting and favoriting everything. It's just going to help help your chosen hashtag get up the um, get up the page. So this is like it's just like a nicer framed photo than I probably would have taken. So one of the things is that I my neighbour actually came and I got him to text me some of the photos that he took because he's not on social media. And so that's also something that um, we did with Kat, um, who's on the call, helped out by doing taking some photos of the Melbourne rally and then I just put captions on them um, because she's getting used to using... Um, Twitter. So one thing to consider and particularly around people with um, uh, issues around uh, disability or being confined to the house is that you could really be organised about having a team of people to do support social media from home and I think it's something that we don't think proactively about as much as we should. Um, so I just wanted to yeah kind of flag that with people. Um, and 
this is one last example I'll give while we're open on this one. Um, Twitter is also great for absolutely shredding our opposition. So they put a whole bunch of money into two different campaigns, I think. They didn't learn their lesson. There was a second one after this about the little black rock, the little black rock that could or something, something about coal. And um, so people just saw the Australians with coal and <laughs> and ran with it. That's terrifying. Um, so that's one of the things in terms of kind of, you know, brand jacking or, you know, hijacking some of the, uh, of the way that other people are presenting things um, it actually can be quite helpful. So I'm just going to stop the share there, just go back to some of the questions to see if I've missed anything. Um, okay, what am, where do we go? Can't. Lead frontline. Oh, okay. You showed that picture. Does TweetDeck flip to the handle you were logged into automatically? Um, you choose your column and you type from that column. So basically, you would have your username set up as as your personal one or your um, other one. Um, and you'll also find on your phone, like um, you will be, be able to choose between if you add it, you can add accounts to your Twitter app as well and you'll be able to choose and, and post from that account. That's one thing to be a bit mindful of if you've got a very different personal account to a work account that you're act, not accidentally too sassy on your, <laughs> on your work account <laughs> or too rude. Um, what else have we got? Personal repercussions. Um, did you want to explain that one, Erin? What was the context that you were asking about? Uh, um, so at that at that point, Kai was talking about how one of the koalas was on its own hashtag, which I imagine is fantastic. But I also, as a bit of a control freak, have a have a mild freak out about the idea that something that I put out into the world in social media then becomes its own entity and you have no control over it. Um, so I'm just, I am curious about what, what pushback there might be with these sorts of things. Do you want to answer that, Kai? Well, yeah, I mean, I think because, because of what the situation was and it's helping koalas, there was just no risk of that happening. But yeah, I, I, I'm struggling to think of an example, another personal example where it's, it's been a negative. The, I mean, the one, in terms of what I can think of, the main ones have actually been um, people that kind of haven't done the right thing or brands that haven't done the right thing and they've just been, you know, mercilessly taken the piss out of. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean... I can't really think of an example on that in particular. Um, one of the things that you will find is that opponents will try to dilute the strength of hashtags by deliberately mistyping them. So if you actually see Black Lives Matter mm. and um, uh, people who are trying to stop that from trending will spell that with one T and it will sort of, it will go further up the... Um, uh, the sort of the hierarchy of what comes up automatically in your auto text. And so there's things like that that happen. Once something starts trending, then you'll also find that your trending subjects can be um, absolutely obliterated by a lot of spam and stuff like that. So that's probably more of a greater risk, spam and like really grotty kind of porn pictures and stuff like that. That's more of a concern. Um, I'm interested to learn how to do a basic thread. Yep, so I reckon I'll come back to that one. Um, agree with the issue that you've said there, Stephen, about personal repercussions. There's people that are very clearly um, using pseudonyms and that's fine. Um, 
uh, I think it's actually um, you know quite useful and it suits some people and then you don't have to worry so much about you know accidentally tweeting the wrong thing or pissing the wrong person off or whatever um, I, uh, Nicola just on that I mean I'm assuming so I went for a job interview the other day and I'm sort of assuming that the HR manager's job is going to be to um, you know, see if yeah. there are any um, you know check people's social media accounts to mm -hmm. see what they're into isn't it is that yeah. right yeah I, I would I would suggest that standard procedure these days yeah. if you're going into um, yeah um, I didn't get a job for example because um, they thought that I was a little bit too vocal about the ALP on uh, social media and um, there was a requirement to do some lobbying work with them so um yeah it is it is something that you need to be careful of and uh i think probably i'm in a slightly different position in that i've you know been kind of living on the outskirts for a while um and so there's l less repercussions for me than there would be if i was the head of a law center or you know um something like that what's that for example <laughs> for example yeah um uh yeah so let me just check here i just want to make sure i don't miss things keen to understand to twitter how to use to know what's going on yes um sharing key articles any ideas on how to get around the firewall um yeah okay i'm gonna i'm gonna switch back over to the i think going through the um little presentation that i've got is actually probably going to cover quite a few of these questions so just going to swap over to that um what i will get people to do is just yell out if there's stuff that you don't understand or so i can show the full screen without having to have the side bar so you guys can see it properly just yell out or put your hand up um, if there's stuff that's not clear because uh, I'm just going to go through some of the some of the basics and and uh, uh, sort of nuts and bolts of why you would use Twitter um, and what stuff it's good for. One moment. <clears throat> oh, where did my PowerPoint go? I don't know why they do this. You'd think that we would all be completely expert at Zoom by now, wouldn't you? Okay, are you seeing tweeting for fun and influence? We are. Yes. Fabulous. Yes. Okay. So, I'll just open that up so you can see that better. Oh, it's a good slideshow though. Sorry? It's not as, like, yes, that's what I'm, I'm just trying to hide myself so I can put it into slideshow. Go away. I have a bit of a unsticky mouse at the moment. There we go. Okay. So um, good photos are really helpful for campaigns. This photo is, I'm pretty sure I took a version of it, but probably a bunch of us did as well. And I've used it a heap of times. Um, so bearing in mind, like what is actually going to be useful, shareable photographics uh, for Twitter. Uh, and also, you know, you'll use them in any bunches of other medium as well. Um, you can take decent photos on your phone and I think that that's just worth sort of recognising. Um, uh, yeah, so in terms of Twitter and what it's good for, uh, we've covered off uh, some of that, I guess. Um, this, the couple of the other things um, I would say is it is very useful for opposition research. So if you are following along on an issue, uh, you're following along to get a sense of how different MPs approach things, um, then actually there's a wide variety of competency on Twitter. Some pollies are really good at it, some are useless, some don't do it at all and have their staff do it. 
um, you tend to be able to tell the ones that are real and good. Um, but either way, you're going to get a sense of what is um, is helpful. Um, it is good for breaking news. So if you find out that there is, you know, um, so for example, during the bushfires, along with ABC, there was a lot of really helpful information shared on Twitter. And uh, the issue is that it can be a little bit confusing with hashtags. So one of the things that you want to try to do is if you're using it for campaign work or an event is it's a pet peeve of mine is that I see events with people with like a thousand phone cameras and people putting stuff on Insta and people don't announce a hashtag. Um, really, really encourage people to do that and to remind people to do that because it just, you know, it triples, quadruples the power of your posts because they're actually all going to come through on one stream. So in terms of actually um, uh, condensing and um, highlighting and building um, campaigns and events, that's actually really helpful. Uh, it drives the news. So I would say that just as, for example, um, morning radio, um, still does drive the news to an extent that uh, that Twitter does. Um, and I think that you can tell that by how much they complain about how it doesn't, to be honest, um, when they talk about, you know, the, those idiots on Twitter and they're screaming into the void and the bubble and all of that kind of stuff. Um, they do monitor Twitter, our opponents, uh, and it actually can be really helpful for... Um, uh, you know, getting issues up on the radar and it's not such a hard thing if you've, if you've got a few built up accounts to, um, you know, to get things trending. So it can be really helpful in uh, following hashtags and then it can be really helpful in when you have got photogenic content that can be embedded into news stories with the restrictions on newsrooms at the moment. Uh, it builds community. And um, I think that there is, yeah, I think what you want, to me, if you're new to Twitter, follow some people that you like and that you think are fun or kind or, you know, you really like their politics, you look up to them, whatever. Um, and then by following them, you're going to find cool people to follow and cool people to follow and cool people to follow. And that's sort of how I think you can avoid um, uh, you know, ending up being caught in this like just like really negative loop. Um, I do think it's good to try to not just stay in a bubble. Um, but if that's what you want to do and that's the issues that you're following, you know, maybe you are just happier in the bubble and you know, stay with that. Um, you can monitor issues and breaking news. Um, I think that's really uh, useful. Um, for, yeah, just, I guess, you know, say if you had a list of the um, main, you know, ABC news channels or whatever, that you would actually find that it's really helpful to, to just keep a watch on thing, particularly if you're talking about an action or an issue or a campaign that's live and that you want to make sure that if you're talking about it that day that you know everything about it and that, you know, something hasn't come up. Uh, late that you're going to sort of be blindsided by. Um, and the other thing is learning. I, I learn a lot um, from critical thinkers on Twitter and I follow a lot of different Aboriginal people and I find that really rewarding and I, I sort of really feel like I get a sense for their politics and critical analysis and thinking around issues as it emerges. So... I think that it is, it's um, yeah, definitely good for more than just ranting. Uh, so we've pretty much covered that. It gives you access to journalists. When you've only got 10 followers, to be honest, journalists are probably not going to pay heaps of attention to you. As you build up more followers, 
uh, then they may well do that. Or if your content is compelling enough, they may well do that. So there's a few journos that I'm sort of at the point of just like being a little bit chatty with or replying to things that they've written or occasionally DMing them with um, bits of information and that can be very helpful. Um, we've talked about digital solidarity. Uh, what makes a good hashtag? Short uh, is obviously really good because it's going to give you more time. Short and obvious. Um, a lot of people try to get too clever for themselves, I think. Um, and I think just something that can't be easily, you want to just quickly double check that the hashtag that you want to use isn't the same acronym as for, you know, a child porn website or something like that. Um, but yeah, choosing your hashtag for events and being proactive before 17 other variations of hashtags pop up is really helpful. Uh, the, the final one on that page is to feed the beast. One of the issues that I've had in doing um, teaching activists at events to, to, to use Twitter is that they think that doing like a couple of pictures is live tweeting an event. And pretty much if you're live tweeting, you should be on your phone the whole time. Um, that you should be doing short interviews with people, you should be tweeting updates, you should be checking to see if there's any news articles on the issue, you should be replying and engaging with people that are interested in things. And um, one of the things that I think that I saw first being done quite well in terms of grassroots folk is when Margot Kingston got involved with the lead blockade and she um, put some sort of work and in, into developing that the lead blockade hashtag and really getting that building and the profiles that people would do to sort of humanize the activists that were taking direct action were I thought really helpful and they've sort of set a bit of a precedent for how grassroots activists can do that stuff now. Um, this is an example I'm just going to give of sort of telling the story of a day um, through Twitter. Uh, so this was one of the um, uh, student strikes uh, that I supported. So uh, you might start the day talking about, um, you know, people gathering and you, I, I could have put um, some wording in there with some quotes from uh, Siobhan and Michaela there. Um, you're showing pictures of the crowds. You've got these, you know, really fun signs that uh, everyone likes, the sort of the sassy kind of signs. Um, you want to tell a story in a picture. So that middle one, for example, we're fighting for climate justice. You can see that they're in an office building. You can see that the cop is asking them questions. You know, that's a story in itself that you can then explain. You can see how stoked they are with themselves for getting their very first move on notices, little baby activists. Um, and then stuff like actually reminding people about calls to action with the physical number, as well as putting that into, <coughs> excuse me, into a tweet um, is really helpful. Uh, I'm just gonna pop back. Oh, sorry, I'll just go through this bit real quickly and then we'll sort of open it back up again. Um, yeah, why should people care? One of the things is you need to look like you care. Uh, I've found that a lot of people just laze around at actions or I'm just not excited when I see people with, you know, takeaway coffee cups and stuff um, looking like they are kind of not taking stuff seriously. Um, an action should have a beginning, middle and end. Most people forget to say that the day is finished. So they, everyone is tired and they've been up very late the night before. And if you're wanting to tell a story of a direct action in this example, you want to make sure that everyone knows that people got home safe and that, you know, you do follow up. Um, uh, and and you explain and you bring people with you. There's I've definitely seen it done very well where people have 
really built the story of the day and it feels like you're there and people actually love it and they're sort of you know maybe they're at work but they're keeping the screen open and they're and they're checking for updates so you you're bringing people with you on your action and um i think that's that's really important um so with video i don't know i i would guess that this is probably not the assumed wisdom on this this is just my personal preference one of the things that i've done some work with with a group called digital storytellers is to kind of work out how we can get bang for buck on any footage and photos that we that we take so rather than filming inside the um in the inside the twitter app or um well facebook live is a little bit different but the same with facebook if i was just putting a, a short video snippet up is that i would tend to actually use the video um that's not in in twitter and then import it uh, and that way you've actually got a higher res version of the video that you can use for other things um, you might want to cut it together with other things and um, it's not compressed and it's not in the kind of square format um, that's just a personal um, preference i also find that the the new way that they import photos means that you can't actually see some of the captions and the tags on some tweets so i'll double check to see if anyone's got any thoughts on that when i open it back up but um i think that that's uh I've found that more effective basically because it gives you more flexibility to to use that content again. Um, Periscope is the inbuilt live uh, video, which uh, is really useful. Um, you need to make sure that your camera is flipped the right way and you need to have a clear uh, announcement about what your video is. Uh, it can be difficult to do that just with one person. Um, so that's probably a bit of a next step um, conversation. Um, the real basics of Twitter for people that don't have lots of followers, the way you build followers is, is by being useful to people, is by, um, you know, maybe not sharing that one Guardian article that thousands and thousands of other people have shared, but sharing something else that's relevant um, talk to other people sometimes there is snobbery and you know some people won't talk back to you but uh, you know you sort of work out who your people are and who's friendly um, and in terms of building followers you know the point to me of having followers is not to be popular but it's to have reach when it matters and so i have found the best way to pick up followers is live tweeting events and you end up picking up a lot um, when you do it that way. Um, mute, the power is in your hands. So in terms of a safe or less harassed Twitter experience, the mute button is my favorite. You can block people, which means that they can see that you've blocked them. But if you mute people, so, um, you would basically go to a profile of someone who is harassing you and um, you hover over the um, over their name and you mute them. They're just screaming into the void and there's something quite satisfying about that. They think that you're just ignoring them, um, but you just can't see them. And so I think it is a great feature and I have quite fun with it. And I think we'll leave that bit there and we'll come back if we've got time because I just want to make sure we get to questions. So how was that as a bit of a sort of overall? Was that sort of useful for what people were looking for? Um, let's open up for questions and discussion. And also question uh, any questions I missed from the group chat. Very helpful, thanks. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Do you think it's more useful to share other people's tweets or information or to kind of craft your own or does it depend on the situation? Both. I would do both every time, pretty much. Um, so 
uh, one of the things with sharing other people's tweets is that you're you're amplifying them. You know, some people are going to appreciate that. So you're building, you know, a, a trust and a relationship. Um, and sharing your own content is feeding kind of like your own perspective into the story. So, for example, with the with the Black Lives Matter uh, protests over the weekend. Um, oh, so one of the things actually that I didn't add in is that is is Twitter can be very good for accountability. Um, as we've seen with some of the police violence and, and stuff that's been happening. It spreads a lot further because it's, uh, you know, Facebook will spread person to person and it's through your friendship networks, but Twitter is more likely to kind of get to news journals, MPs, things like that. So accountability is really helpful. So when people were pepper sprayed at the action in Sydney Central, uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, protest on the weekend before last. Um, that was where that was where I I found out um, uh, and sort of followed up what was happening. Um, so that's really helpful. So in that case, I would be um, retweeting any info like that to help boost it. I would also be, from a counteract perspective, I would be you know, calling it to account, um, you know, from a personal perspective, you know, just supporting and checking in on people. I tweeted and replied to people with resources about how to look after themselves, um, how to do witness statement. So that sort of on the ground stuff is really helpful as well. Um, but I think it's, I think everyone brings their own perspective. And so um, particularly if you want to build followers. So if you're the main person on ground tweeting at another time, then always tweet your own stuff as well as retweeting other people's. Yeah, that's my take. Michael? More on, um, basically more on exactly what Kat just said. I feel like I never have um, anything original to say, or at least that hasn't been said better by others. Um, so my tweets are like 100 likes and retweets to one actual um, something original for me. Um, so I, I sort of regard myself more as, um, as uh, um, what's, I've forgotten the word. An but, amplifier. Uh, a, yeah, both an amplifier and a, um, a, a gateway or a collator, whatever the librarian yeah, term is. Yeah, a curator. For, uh, curator, that's the one, thanks. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's great when you do that. And if you're on an action, then you tend to have something more original to say or because it's just relevant to the action. But most of the time it's others have said a lot better, so I just amplify that. Yeah, and and it can be a mix of both and there can be things that you will have a personal insight into that other people won't um, and there can be things that... Um, I Like I know, for example, one thing that I've pulled back a little bit from myself is that some tweets you don't need to add your own angle to when you're retweeting, you know, like some people have already said it, it's already smart, it's already funny, it's already sharp. Um, and particularly if it's, if it's me amplifying marginalised voices, I have pulled back a little, like I've tried to be more conscious about that and actually kind of like not feeling like I need to add my own layer onto, onto things. So that's, that's just a learning that I've, kind of gone through yeah there was another hand before i thought were you putting up your hand dragonfly or was that just moving around is that you carly or are you just stretching and napping <laughs> carly's gone to sleep Stephen. <laughs> Stephen. <to> sit, Stephen. <laughs> yeah i guess um look i'm running three facebook accounts uh, and and what's really been preventing me from launching out into Twitter although people have encouraged me to do that is I, I just don't know that my brain can handle any more social media and yeah. I've stopped reading books for God's sake I'm meant to be a you know somebody who reads books um, so I don't know about that I, I think it's I think it's a really different forum and one of the bits that I've sort of struggled with is how to explain that it has its own 
it, to me, it has its own rhythm and its own flow. And I don't know if, you know, like, I mean, I know Glenn, you've used it a bunch and Kai, you have, but I feel like that's something that took me a while to get used to. There's sort of, there's a sort of an unspoken etiquette and there is, you know, like there's a cool kids gang, you know, there's people that, you know, like you might retweet or try and gauge with and they like, they'll never talk to you, but they'll talk to other people and it's all, you know, some of it's just a bit weird and a bit like normal life. Um, but I do think that the difference is Facebook is having a conversation with your friends and Twitter is having a conversation with the outside world and engaging on issues. Um, so one of the things, unfortunately, that I wouldn't recommend is that people do set up the ability to auto-tweet, um, say, an Instagram post or a Facebook post to Twitter. Um, it's actually not recommended and the the vibe and the kind of tone of those um, different forums is quite different. So some people might might tell you like that's the shortcut and that's how you can sort of engage. Uh, I wouldn't typically recommend it. But I think for me, I, I need to get better at it. It's definitely something I need to improve on. But for me, what I, when I am organised, what I'll do is I will check in in the morning and see, you know, kind of what's happening that day on anything that I'm interested in. I, I do want Counteract to be breaking news on direct action and, and giving people those inspiring stories of resistance while we're all, you know, sort of being drowned in so much negative stuff. So that is something that I look out for. But I can, I can have a quick scroll of that, you know, while I'm in bed, not that's not very healthy i'm not recommending that but just because i've got chronic pains sometimes my days start slowly um and i can see some good stuff i can schedule a few tweets and i can just look at it and schedule sort of slots to look at it in so rather than feeling like you have to respond all of the time i think you can organize your time um to do that well and i think particularly the issue that you're working on at the moment, Stephen, obviously with the um, with with the amount of attention that is happening on the the destruction of indigenous cultural sites, that it is a good place to be engaging, um, and there is, you know, like these critical thinkers and and people out there that are uh, are sharing and talking about this stuff, and there's so many. Um, for me, there's so many Aboriginal voices that I really enjoy following on there and I feel like I just learn heaps from them. So maybe there's there's a lot of people that just lurk. Like sometimes I'm like, like, who the hell are these 2,000 people following me because they don't talk to me? Um, you know, uh, I don't know who some of them are, but um, uh, some people just kind of like watch and don't engage and, you know, maybe that might be, your style as, you know, somebody who wants to research. Um, could I just make, that's a really interesting comment, uh, Nicola, about uh, Aboriginal people and you know, I'm an anthropologist. So one of the things, and this is more relate, right, relates more to Facebook than um, Twitter, but uh, one of the things I find very interesting about um, Facebook is a very different way in which Aboriginal people use Facebook. I think that's really something to watch. Um, and they're much more uninhibited than uh, non-Aboriginal people tend to be. And they use yeah. it as a way of, um, I don't know, um, somehow enforcing um, social rules via Facebook. Uh, it's quite confronting sometimes, but it's, it's really... Mm. Sorry, I, I didn't catch the last bit. I just think it's a, I think it's very interesting, um, and I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry it doesn't relate more specifically to Twitter, but I just think the way Aboriginal people use Facebook is very yeah. uh, culturally and socially specific, and it's really something worth um, you know paying attention to. Yeah, it is, and people are very honest and kind of like lay it all on the table with these really frank sort of live mm. feeds and um, very unfiltered. Um, and some of Twitter is like that as well. And I do, I like that honesty. I like that you're getting, you know, this raw 
um, reality from people and people not varnishing, you know, what it's like for them. Um, and, you know, some very feisty people. Um, so, yeah, was there other questions? Just checking that I've captured everyone's. Yes, I will send the slides as a follow up. Um, I just had something to answer to the question. Sorry, can I say? Yeah, something? go, Matt. Go. Yeah, uh, about um, not having time to go from Facebook to also using Twitter. Um, one really easy way to do it is um, you can get. Uh, onto the website called Hootsuite um, and there's a free version of Hootsuite. There's also an app for it. Um, so with the free version, you can have three social media accounts um, uh, and on different platforms and run them at the same time. Yeah. And you don't have to post the same thing on all three platforms at once, but mm -hmm. it's an easy way to log into all three at once, view all of them at once, and, you know, you might put something on Facebook and then copy and paste a small section of that, like up to 280 characters of that, and put it onto your Twitter account. Um, yeah, and that's just a really easy way of posting up to three platforms at once. And if you want to pay for it, you can post up to, like, way more accounts at once and have multiple people on your team as well that log in. Yeah. Um, so it's something we've been using with XR Sydney and it's been really, really helpful. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm interested to know if, if it's possible to post on Twitter as an active, like, cause I run a separate like family planning movement as well. And I'm wondering like, can I post on like Twitter? And this is related to that previous question as well. Like, is it possible to just like post your content on Twitter? and not really worry about what people say in reply and not really engage back too much? Or would you say that you really need to kind of be on top of what people are replying to you? I think it probably depends how controversial your content is. Uh, I do think you want to reply and engage because that's how, like if, you, if you're posting something that you think is important, then why not? keep talking to people about it, I guess. Um, yeah, so I, I would suggest that it is good to engage. Um, that does remind me one of the things that people often do do if they're um, live tweeting an event or a rally or, or something like that is that they'll forget to check their mentions and their notifications and there's heaps of journos and people who do those kind of like collated Twitter articles and Storyful and some of those different organisations who will say, you know, can we use your, can we use your footage or um, are you available for an interview? So that's just one little tip that a lot of people will just be sending stuff out but forget to check what's coming back. Um, and I do think that that's worthwhile. If it's just a media release and you're saying, you know, contact us via you know, you're tweeting a link to a media release and it's got a different contact point, then, you know, no worries. But you'll find that people will often just reply in the forum that they've seen the, the first bit of content in. So, yeah. But yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't have to take up your whole day either. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So. Actually, something I just remembered is you can check your mentions and replies on Hootsuite and reply to them from Hootsuite. So you, don't need, you still don't need to go on Twitter to do all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> Glenn, do you want to clarify your question? Uh, yeah. Um, just on Twitter, um, because I have different um, things I'm interested in, I follow and talk about different things. And, the, you know, obviously Counteract, you've got a plan that, you know, your NVDA support, you know, Indigenous support, those sort of things. You're, you've got quite a far, focused, narrow um, voice, whereas I'm sort of scattered all over the place. Yeah. Could you just talk to that a bit? As in, do you mean your personal account yeah. or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think that probably it's taken a while to, it's probably taken us a while to get a little bit more focused um i think and it's actually you know only um 
I think it's I think it's really different tweeting from a personal account than it is from an organizational account. And there's some tweets that would be kind of almost exactly the same or people would say like I can totally just hear you saying that on a on the counteract account. But there's also some that I would tweet, um, you know, I've got interests in all kinds of different things so that I would tweet differently. Um, so, I mean, I know people jokingly talk about their personal brand. Um, and But people do have a personal brand, but I don't really see that suiting someone like you or being of interest, to, you know, like, um, so... I do think, I think people have styles of speaking and kind of tones and phrases and it's like you still can have a similar conversational style, but you're talking about different subjects, I guess. Not really sure what else to say about that one, to be honest. Yeah. Can I just say something about that, Nicola? Look, maybe this is not so appropriate to activism, but with um, Fremantle Carnivale uh, stuff, which is more a satirical kind of thing. I mean, we've done quite a bit of stuff with sort of glove puppet type of stuff where you set up um, multiple um, satirical personalities and you uh, actually get quite a fun uh, sort of funny dialogue um, going there. And I think that's something to think about. Like when I'm posting to Friends of Australian Rock Art, for instance, I often comment on my uh, you know, my own comments that I've, I've made in a different voice. I think that's something that's maybe worth uh, uh, experimenting a bit with you know, glove puppets. <laughs> yeah, you just need to make sure that you um, are using the right um, uh, the right voice because I think um, a few someone's trying to get back in, I think. Hopefully it's not a random Zoom bomber. Um, I think that uh, there's a few MPs and stuff that have been caught out, you know, like commenting, uh, like, true. oh, my gosh, that's so awesome, you know, on their own posts, and, <laughs> you know, kind of looking a little bit stupid. Um, <laughs> hello, iPhone, who are you? Hello? Nope, they've gone. <laughs> Interesting. Um and what was what were you saying same to you, Kat with the with the voice? I was just saying uh, kind of similar thoughts in that I have a lot of different kind of campaigns that I've been involved in or would like to be involved in, and I've only got like eighty or hundred followers on Twitter because I'm not very experienced at it yet. Yeah, and it comes across seeming really I don't know maybe it comes across seeming quite jumbled and like I'm not out of blockade living this one campaign so me just posting random things like one day I'm at a rally one day I'm showing someone else do a tree sit is it relatable is it useful for me to yeah just I think be so completely random it's not random though it's, you care about a bunch of stuff you know I think that that's actually really important and like I I do that as well I'm I'll be tweeting about you know, five different issues in a day. So I don't think you need to, um, people will follow you because you're talking about interesting things or they're learning stuff from you or um, you're on the ground and you're connected to stuff that they otherwise wouldn't have access to. Um, so, yeah, I don't think, I kind of don't think we need to, if you're an organisation, it's different. But, like, as people, I don't think we really need to sort of commodify ourselves in that way, if you know what I mean. Like, mm. we're, allowed, we're allowed to care about a bunch of different things. We're complex beings. Um, and heaps of people on Twitter tweet about all different kinds of things. You know, people have chats and conversations about, you know, I've, I've had conversations with some people about, you know, cute doggos or their favourite nail polish or their, you know, thoughts on refugees, you know, the same person. So it's kind of, um, uh, yeah, it's, I wouldn't give yourself a hard time over that, I think. Um, build, like, build a following to the point that it's useful. And, and one of the things, again, I'll say, because we'll finish shortly, is that I'll do a little list up of the people on here and maybe we can commit to a bit of digital solidarity amongst the, the folks on this call. And, um, you know, like I, I really want to, you know, people who have supported me, who have bigger followings than me, I want to support anyone who, 
who needs their voice amplified as well. Like it's a really basic concept that we, you know, have each other's back. So um, I think that it'd be really great to be more supportive of each other and to be, you know, retweeting each other's um, content and um, sharing it with people or letting people know, you know, if it's a particular issue, you know, particularly say with, you know, say you're talking about tree sits and stuff, like not many people in the country know that stuff, you know, like you're an expert on that, you know, whether or not that feels weird. So that's actually really of interest to people. And like, that's something that I think the people that follow Countrack would be interested in. So why wouldn't I want to retweet that, you know? Um, so yeah. Or what, or why wouldn't you want to like tweet that from Countract if you're going to be one of our, um, counter activators. Um, yeah. So you do you, you know, <laughs> um, any last questions before we call it a night? No. Uh, could I ask people to, we'll just do a final round and give me a one word summation about how you, how you found it and if there's anything more you want. Uh, going clockwise, Michael. I've obviously got to explore TweetDeck a lot more. Um, I keep hearing about it and then forgetting about it, but you've um, inspired me. Thank you. Great. Um, it's not a one thing with Sweet Deck, don't get overwhelmed by the look of it. It looks like it's complex, but it's actually not. So don't look at it and go, yeah. Oops, that was more um. than one word. <laughs> um, Sana? Yeah, really good. Thanks. Um, I'm kind of a newbie. And even though it was a bit stuffy, I think I, I picked up a lot of on this. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Anything else you're after in terms of follow up resources? No, maybe if you can share the slides, that would be awesome. Yeah, I will do that. Thanks. Cool. Um, Stephen. You're on mute. Sorry. Um, yeah, just worried my head is going to explode if I take on Twitter as well as Facebook, but I'll give it a go. <laughs> no worries. We don't want your head to explode, mate. Um, uh, Carly. Yes, hi. <laughs> um, I was just adding everyone. Um, yeah, um, I learned a lot. Thank you. Uh, I already do tons and tons of social media and this was actually really informative. So thank you so much. Great. I'm glad to hear. Erin. Uh, uh, yeah, illuminating. Thank you. Um, I am kind of wondering why the hell I didn't join Twitter 20 years ago <laughs> yeah, that's just my um my gen z son telling me that twitter wasn't around 20 years ago um so we can thanks for the tip dom sorry <laughs> um but i do recall being on holiday with nicola some time ago and seeing tweet deck you know when i say some time ago probably 10 years ago and feeling <laughs> mystified by it and now thinking oh shit why wasn't i on that then building up and following um yeah, so no, great. Thank you. I feel like I need to practice a bit more and then I will have more questions. Yeah, yeah, sure. And maybe we'll, um, I'll check back in with people because this sort of, this was sort of wasn't a 101, I guess this was a 201 or something like that. But um, it'd be lovely to get a little bit more into some of the detail about how to do some more of the live streaming really well and, you know, some of that um the next step up. Oh, this is my this is my tip for you all. It's a selfie stick. <laughs> and I had never I would never dream of owning it just generally, just so you all know. Um, even though the Gen Zers that I was working with were laughing at me. I was like, isn't that a Gen Z thing? They're like, no, we're too cool for selfie sticks. Um, but uh, so this is like super useful for getting up to get crowd photos. So you can click, click down here and you can actually, if you're a shorty like me, um, you've got to hold it quite still, but I do find it really helpful to get like short sort of like little pan videos and crowd photos. So good tip for rallies and like big events. 
and Glenn has a nerdy twin as well, I see. <laughs> um, Glenn, do you have feedback? Um, yeah, I'm just always in Twitter in and out and struggle and the Facebook algorithms have got me, so I'm trying to withdraw from that awful um, drug. So um, I suppose I came to the webinar, so I need to make more effort. Um, yeah, but the content was good. Great. Thank you. Uh, Kat? Yeah, it was really good. I have usually been on kind of the other side of activism, not involved in online and media sort of segments, doing more direct action, but now my life's in a position that I think I could be more useful doing that media and online stuff. Yeah. Um, so that was really good. I appreciate that. Um, I think I'd like some more practice with it and then to maybe check back in at some point. Particularly, I'd like to know more about tweeting as an organisation. Um, yeah. Yeah. But thanks, yeah, that's great. And, and that's maybe something I can, um, I'll, I think I've got a couple of examples of templates so people can have a look at that about how you create your, like your tone and your voice and your style and, you know, yeah, how you want to present your organisation. Um, yeah, so happy to talk to people more about that as well. Um, Zoe? Uh, yeah, a bit similar to Erin, probably like frustrated in the sense that there's so like I'm frustrated that I just didn't get onto this earlier uh, and um, yeah didn't use it effectively as a tool in previous campaigns uh, uh, but also uh, excited and a little bit daunted because it is just still a new platform and getting my head around it all. yeah but awesome session thank you so much that they were really helpful like like I now have a much clearer idea of how I can use it going forward great and uh, now I've got everybody except Kai. Did we get you, Carly? Yep. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to Kai in particular because I know that you maybe wanted to be having some time out and you've taken time to share with us your beautiful story of koalas. And yes, best, thank you, Kai. The best content okay. ever. And Thanks, I know Kai. it really made my day when I saw some of the tweets and I like, I was really stoked to, um, yeah, like to see that, like I could be helpful. Yeah, totally. Amazing. Amazing to experience how that, that shift, like that instant within, you know, a matter of minutes and hours yeah yeah just, it was just it wasn't much was it like you just needed yeah. that one tweet to get out there for people to see what you were doing and um yeah. yeah so that's how we all help each other right like um so anyone who needs stuff shared tag me or ping me and i will share it and um mm. i'm sure kai will you know help share it share things now that he's more famous than me because he's adorable and he hangs out with adorable cuddly animals <laughs> Um, Michael? So just a couple people said about um, not having really been with Twitter. I totally changed my opinion of it. Um, I used to think Facebook was the way to go and utterly reversed that. Like Twitter with its 128 characters, I thought it was stupid. But then it doubled that. But it's not just that. It's that any tweet can be an infinitely big thing with photos attached and web addresses and, and threads and so on there's much more seriousness and chance to have serious discussion in Twitter, I think, than I see on Facebook. Yeah. Um, and, so I reversed. and the thing is that, like, it's very easy for us to be um, uh, censored by opponents on Facebook and by MPs and stuff like that. But, and, you know, like, they can block you, you know, there's definitely MPs that have got a habit of blocking people more than others, but they are watching and journos are watching and then you see campaigns that are exceptional and huge like RoboJet and that was the hard yards of months of people on Twitter highlighting these stories and highlighting the stories until mainstream media finally picked it up. And so, you know, that was um, done... Um, I believe, actually, if anyone is going to the Virtual Progress event next week that um, Asha Wolf, who is probably, I reckon probably like the most um, uh, followed 
activist on Twitter in Australia. Um, she's doing a case study on uh, the robo debt campaign. Um, and I've got some cheaper tickets if people need them as well. So let me know. There's also some other good speakers and stuff like that too. So um, there are there are certainly campaigns that have started on there and then gone mainstream. And so it is, again, a way of subverting that sort of influence of mainstream media and, um, yeah, taking some power back for, for grassroots, really. Because, um, honestly, I actually don't see many NGOs doing a great job at Twitter either. And I don't really know why. I genuinely don't. Like, my, maybe some people think it's been there, done that. But um, I still think it's really useful. So, um, and I've seen the value of it personally so i'd recommend yeah getting into it and definitely just want to encourage more people to be getting into it so we can um yeah get our issues out there where we need but we're, we're 10 minutes over and um yeah i'll call it a night so thank you everybody it was yeah it was lovely to um we could do a goodbye to everybody <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for, your, thanks for your efforts, Nicola. Awesome. And I'll let you know what's coming up next. We're going to do a one of the sessions that people seem quite keen on is the one I didn't get to do in Melbourne, which is how to manage dealing with authority and police as an activist. Um, and we've got some security culture stuff and a bunch of other stuff coming up. So um, Rebel School shall continue and... Uh, if Erin was the only, whoever did any tweeting and managed it, I'll get them some kind of prize. <laughs> I think it was probably just you, Erin. Koala stamp. Koala stamp. Koala stamp. Glenn also yeah. got one in. I'm always but, one for the positive reinforcement. Give me a koala stamp, us, I'll do pretty much anything. I can't. Okay. Right. was linked to each other, Nick. Oh, something just went weird. So I think, I think basically, Kai, you've got to get a koala to go and stamp. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everybody.